Please turn to the book of Zechariah and chapter 12, please. We continue our study, the book of Zechariah. Zechariah being one of the three prophets from the period of the return from captivity after the people of Judah had been in Babylonian captivity and allowed to return. The first chapters are visions describing how God was accepting them back as his people and the leadership and so forth, but also, also as uh, symbols of the coming Christ and the rule that he would have as both king and priest. The last few chapters, as we continue through these, are discussing various prophecies about Judah and about her enemies. And the section we're in, in now, the last section, uh, chapters 12 through 14, is predictions, I believe, of the gospel age. We finished chapter 11 last time in which Zechariah, I believe, was prophesying regarding the rejection of Jesus by the rulers and the people when Jesus came that the staffs of beauty and or favor and bonds or union would be broken indicating that the nation would no longer have a special place in God's plan because they would reject the Messiah. And as a result, uh, they would be rejected. They could still as individuals be saved, but as a nation, they no longer had a purpose in his plan. And part of the problem was, at least that led to it, was a rejection of the Messiah. So in chapter 11, we've discussed then the fact that the shepherds of Israel, which I believe is primarily then the scribes and Pharisees, the other religious leaders who misled the people uh, the staffs of bonds and beauty and bonds were symbolic of the blessings that God had as gave the people as his nation, but because of they rejected the Messiah, remember the price paid to predicted to Judah, 30 pieces of silver, as betrayal. But the thing is, it wasn't just Judas who was wrong in that. The religious leaders were the ones who paid to that rejection, that uh, that. Uh, betrayal because they wanted to re reject the Christ and eventually kill him. Now in chapters 12 through 14, we have a, a different direction. And whereas chapter 11 was describing the sins of the nation and especially the leaders that led to the rejection of Jesus, I believe chapters 12 through 14 are especially talking about the kingdom of the Messiah that would come as a result and God's blessings under that kingdom. And if you observe what we had, chapter 11 was a very negative chapter describing the sins, the rejection of the Messiah and the evils of the people. Chapter 12 is positive again, describing the blessings in the reign of the Messiah. And chapters 12, 13, 14, I believe all three go with that pattern. Specifically, we've talked about Zechariah's use of the expression in that day. And we pointed out it's been used a few times already, but look at the chapters 12, 13, and 14. Again and again and again, he refers to in that day. He's talking about a particular period in the uh, future, specifically, and I believe because of the prophecies that we know are fulfilled according to the New Testament, we'll see that it was the time of the Messiah, the kingdom that he would establish and so on, that that refers to that period, that day, that period of time. Now, at the close of our class last time in chapter 12, we were discussing question number five, passages in the New Testament where it shows that the church, the New Testament kingdom, and so on, spiritually is spiritual Israel, spiritual Jerusalem, spiritual Judah. And I believe then, chapters 12 through 14, when they talk about Jerusalem and Israel and Judah, in these chapters, it's now spiritual. I realize it's difficult, it's not easy, it's not an easy book. We've talked about that a number of times, especially this section. But I believe, whereas he has it in the past been talking about literal Jerusalem and Judah and their return from captivity, now he's talking about spiritual Jerusalem, Israel and so on, and we'll see that, I believe, from some of the quotations that are fulfilled in the New Testament. So, we looked at some passages, and here are some that I've summarized for you, some more of these we talked about last time, in which Israel or Jerusalem or whatever is used to refer to the church or God's people, his kingdom in the New Testament, Romans 2, 28 and 29, 
He is not a Jew who is one outwardly. Circumcision is not that which is outward in the flesh. He is a Jew who is one inwardly. Circumcision is of the heart. Spiritual circumcision, spiritual Jews, not the literal nation, physical nation, physical descendants. Galatians 3, 7 and 8. Only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. You see, not physical descendants of Abraham, but those who have faith, the gospel, true faith, they're the spiritual descendants, you see, of Abraham. Galatians chapter 3, then later, verse 28 and 29, if you are Christ, you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. The promise to Abraham and your seed, all nations of the earth will be blessed. If you are Christ, you see, spiritual now. Chapter 6 and verse 16, peace and mercy be upon the Israel of God. Not the Old Testament Israel, spiritual Israel, as we've seen in the quotations, Philippians 3. We are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in flesh. We, those of us who worship through Christ, and rather than trusting in our flesh, our physical lineage from Abraham, rather we trust in Christ. We are the spiritual Israel. And Hebrews 12, 22 and 23, you've come to the heavenly Jerusalem, not the literal Jerusalem, but the heavenly Jerusalem, the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven. And there are other passages we could look at, but the thing that I'm trying to emphasize is the fact that it's perfectly reasonable, especially in a highly symbolic book, to view Jerusalem and the uh, reference to the kingdom and so forth, the remnant, to be spiritual, fulfilled under, under Messiah's age in that day, which is what I think we're seeing in these chapters. Hopefully this, just the overview can at least help us see some of the reasonableness of some of what we're trying to say. So chapter 12, I believe what we have is God is protecting Jerusalem, but they mourn for the son that they pierced. And that's one of our key passages we'll look at as we get to verse 10 of the chapter. So questions or comments before we start in, again in chapter 12. We looked at the first few verses last time, but I want to reread uh, from the beginning and then we'll tie things together. Let's read the first, well, let's try the six, first six verses. Chapter 12, verses 1 through 6. Who'd like to read chapter 12? Verses 1 through 6 for us, please. Chapter 12. Bill, please. Chapter 12, verse 1 through 6. I heard not the word of the Lord against Israel. Thus says the Lord, who stretches out the heavens, lays the foundation of the earth, and forms the spirit of man within him. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. All who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces through all the nations of the earth are gathered against it. And in that day, says the Lord, I will strike every horse with confusion and its rider with madness. I will open my eyes on the house of Judah and I will strike every horse of the peoples with blindness. And the governors of Judah shall say in their heart, The inhabitants of Jerusalem are my strength in the Lord of hosts, their God. In that day I will make the governors of Judah like a fire pan in the wood pot, and I will, I like a fiery torch in the sheaves. They shall devour all the surrounding peoples on the right hand and on the left, but Jerusalem shall be inhabited against their own place, Jerusalem. All right, do you see how he's showing the victory of Judah, Jerusalem, and these verses in contrast to chapter 11, where they were uh, in error and were, uh, they were going to be, God was against them in chapter 11. Now that Jerusalem, the Judah that he's talking about here, he's blessing. He's helping them that, that their enemies, those who opposed them, would be defeated. So it's, uh, again, a significantly change in the tone, which helps us to see that there's something different going on in that, that phrase in that day and later on in verse 10 they will look on him who they pierce these things are showing us that it's a different time period and a different uh, application so starting off again as we did last time verse 1 how does the Lord describe himself in verse 1 and what's the significance of that? questions 1 and 2 how does, how does he describe himself and why does he talk that way as we begin the study Karen. 
Um, says he, he describes himself as one who stretches out the heavens, lays the foundation of the earth, forms the spirit of the man within him, showing his power and omnipotence. Okay. So he starts off talking about who he is, because that's the basis of everything, really, is who he is. But in particular, that's the basis of this defense he's going to make of Jerusalem and of his people. We should believe he can do this and will do this because of who he is. And in particular, he, he, he's made us, forms the spirit of God within him. Okay? So what you're going to do with the, Jerusalem, and this carries through the next few verses, what you're going to do with Jerusalem in verse 2? Bill. He's going to make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all, and all the surrounding peoples. A cup of drunkenness. So I ask you question number four to think about the significance of that. Um, and now if Jerusalem is spiritual, then this is talking about the New Testament king and the New Testament church, the remnant, uh, a spiritual warfare. But what is, how does he describe what's going to happen to those who lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem? What's the significance of the cup of drunkenness? Frank? Right. It's described as a cup of God's wrath in other places. Okay, it's a cup of wrath. What about drunkenness makes that illustration make sense? In what sense is God's wrath against a nation or people like making them drunk? It can make confusion and weakness in them. Okay, confusion, weakness, uh, unable to defend themselves. So uh, it's not, again, it's not a literal drunkenness, it's symbolic uh, that they are powerless to, be, to resist God because God's going to defend his people and his people are going to be uh, like that which causes the enemies to be like they're drunk. They're powerless, they're unable to win a victory against the people. Now he's going to use other illustrations about the same thing as we proceed. Questions, comments? Susie. Well, Isaiah 51 verse 17. <clears throat> um, he says, Awake, awake, stand up, O Jerusalem. You have drunk at the hand of the Lord the cup of his fury. You have drunk the dregs of the cup of trembling and drained it out. Um, further illustrating. And there's lots of examples of that, especially in the prophets, where they talk about uh, God's defeating enemies, making them as though they're drunk. That is, they are defenseless, they are unable, they're confused, and so on, uh, unable to resist the punishment he's bringing upon them. Now, verse 3, he goes with a further illustration now, and we're on question number 7 now. Uh, how does he describe this conflict between Jerusalem and their enemies in verse 3? Terry. Um, the fact that it will be like a stone that's so sharp that when you reach out to touch it, it's a heavy stone. You reach out and try to protect yourself against it or touch it it will cut you to shreds in the idea of God protecting his people. Okay, again, another illustration. So in verse 3, they were like a cup of drunkenness. In verse, excuse me, verse 2, in verse 3, they're like a heavy stone that people try to lift it and throw it away, and they're the ones who get hurt. Not the people that they're trying to hurt, Jerusalem in this case, but the people who are trying to hurt them. They're the ones who suffer as a result. So nations will lay siege to Jerusalem, but God's going to defeat the enemies, you see, in verse uh, 2 and 3. Okay. Uh, other comments? Verse 2 and 3. Okay, so verse 4 then. How does he describe the, the conflict, the battle? In verse 4. And we're on question number 8 now. I describe the conflict in verse 4. Karen? Um, seems like 
he's describing what he's going to do to their enemies as if um, striking a horse with confusion and a rider with madness, as he did literally sometimes in the Old Testament when Israel's enemies came against them. Okay. So now the horses, you see these are the weapons or the means that the enemy is trying to use to defeat Judah, but they will become confused. The riders will have madness. Again, similar to the drunkenness type thing. Um, but he will open his eyes on the house of Judah and strike every horse of the peoples with blindness. So the enemies will be confused, madness, blindness, and so on. Uh, but God is defending his people, the people of Judah. When? When would this happen? In that day. In that day. Right, here's the first one. We're going to see it a bunch of times. When this time comes, when that day, whatever that day is, and we're going to identify, he's going to nail it down by the time we get to verse 10. But when that time comes, that's what's going to happen. Not physical Judah, not physical Jerusalem, I don't believe. Not uh, a physical battle. Spiritual warfare. As we have it described for us in the New Testament, Ephesians 6, the weapons that God provides, the armor he provides, because we're doing battle against the forces of evil, against Satan and his forces, Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 18, spiritual battle, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, same idea. I believe that's what's being described here, and the ultimate victory of the Messiah and his people, because of the power of God, not because we're great, because God, this great one, he described himself in verse 1, he is working for his kingdom to be the, overcome the same power of Satan and his enemies. Okay? Comments through verse 4. All right, verse 5. And now question 9. Who's he talking about in verse 5, first of all? Who's he describing? The inhabitants of Jerusalem. All right, the governors who are talking about the inhabitants, okay? So you got the governors of Judah talking about the inhabitants of Jerusalem. So first of all, I ask the question, who are these governors? Who would that be? Now again, if this is spiritual, if this is the Messiah, age of the Messiah, the gospel age, the New Testament, and the spiritual warfare, who would the governors of Judah be? Well, who would the spiritual leaders be in the age of the Messiah? Okay. Um, the scribes, Pharisees, the priests. Okay, those are the bad guys. Those are the leaders of the bad guys. But I, I believe we're going to see these are the leaders, the good guys. Uh, there, verse 6, he's going to continue to talk about these governors. And they are defeating the enemy. So these are not the bad leaders of chapter 11. I believe we see these are the good leaders in chapter 12. They're going to be like in verse 6, the fire pans and the fiery torch, and that will devour the enemies. Okay, so these are the good guys in this battle, which would then again would be who? Okay, well, who are the spiritual leaders in the New Testament? Who were they? The apostles and the elders. elders, prophets, those were the spiritual leaders in the age of the Messiah, of course, subject to Christ. But if again, if it's the spiritual kingdom, spiritual Judah, these leaders say it in their heart, how do they view the inhabitants of Jerusalem? Now, against Jerusalem, spiritual. How do they view the people of Jerusalem? In the verse 5 yet. They view the people as what? Terry? As strong. Yeah, strong. Strength in the Lord, not in their own power. Strength in the Lord. Their God, okay? So here you have the spiritual leaders leading the people to, get, to depend on the strength of the Lord for their victory. Because God, verse 1, is the one who has the uh, power, 
as the ruler and the creator of the universe and so on. And we'll continue in verse 6 to see what these leaders are able to do then. Other comments, verse 5. Okay, so verse 6 then, these leaders, these governors, what are they compared to? Verse 6. A uh, fire pan in, in the wood pile, like a fiery torch in the sheaves. Okay. So what happens when you throw a fiery torch in the sheaves or a fire pan in the wood pile? What happens? It devours uh, uh, in the sheaves uh, or in the wood pile, it, it devours it. Well, it's going to take fire, aren't you? And the sheaves or the wood pile is going to be burned up. So that's what he says the governors are like. They're like a fire pan in the wood pile, a fire torch in the sheaves. They will devour the surrounding peoples on the right hand and on the left, but Jerusalem shall be inhabited again. In its own place, Jerusalem. So Jerusalem, if that's spiritual Jerusalem, if that's the church, the kingdom of the Messiah in the New Testament, they are going to be the, the winners, the victors, led by their leaders who will overcome, defeat the, the enemies. Okay? That's what I see through verse 6. Comments, questions? Susie, got a question. Uh, I'm not following it at all. I, I don't quite understand how the apostles and elders are... Um, how they're going to devour the surrounding people. Uh, uh, I know it's symbolic, but um, through their represent... Go ahead, Frank. Say it again, please. The, the spiritual application uh, yes. How, how do you apply that in the spiritual sense? Okay. Well, maybe we should ask who the peoples are. They're going to devour the peoples. Who are the peoples? Terry. Well, it would it'd have to be those that come against Jerusalem. So those that were in the siege against the city would be in in the spiritual sense of the time of the Messiah would be Jew, the Jews in some ways that that rejected Christ um, and all people that would come against the kingdom. Okay, so it would be those who would oppose the Messiah and his kingdom, his people. Um, the one thing I would add is the peoples are always Gentiles. But remember, spiritual Gentiles now, not physical Gentiles, because we're not talking physical now. Spiritual Gentiles are those who, like the Gentiles in the Old Testament, opposed God's people physically. Spiritual Gentiles are those who oppose, under the New Testament, those who oppose God's work under the gospel. Back to Ephesians chapter 6 and verses 10 through 12 and so on. Spiritual hosts of wickedness in high places, the hosts of wickedness of Satan and his forces, they oppose God's people, God's work, and the spiritual leaders lead God's people in victory by the power of God. That's what it said in verse 5. Okay? And is that helping any? Okay. Frank. How do they, in what sense do they destroy them? Okay. How do they destroy? How would God's people, and again, don't, don't think of you and me. It's not us. It's God's people, God's kingdom by the power of God. What power does God give to give victory over the enemies, the spiritual enemies? What's the power? Terry. Well, the gospel is the power of salvation. The gospel is the power of God of salvation. Ephesians chapter 6, the armor of God. That's what protects us. That's what provides what we need. That's what gives us victory. 
that we're able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Ephesians 6, verse 10 through 18. Terry. Well, there's only two ways when you're dealing with an enemy. One is to kill him. The other one is to convert him, to become your friend. And conversion would uh, sweep through people like a fire. Yes, and again, it's very highly symbolic. But what we're trying to do is save lost souls, but those who will reject the message are going to be defeated in the end. In many ways, I see this as like the book of Revelation. God's people, are his kingdom, following our Messiah, we're going to win in the end. Not because of who we are, but because of who we're following. Because the victor, Christ, has already won the victory. If we're on his side, we're going to be able to overcome those who would stop us or hinder us from serving God. Is that making more sense? Other comments? Susie? Well, um... I'm not disagreeing with God's word being the power of salvation, um, or to use it for that. But also uh, through um, fulfilled prophecy and miracles, those were those were powerful um, examples. Or I don't know how I want to explain it. Um, Proving that what God was saying, what these people were saying, was true, and that overcame, um, that overcomes all man's philosophies. Right, and who led in those kinds of things? The apostles, the prophets, and so on. Okay. Okay. Other comments. It's not easy. I'm not saying it's easy. Okay. Well, let's read some more then. Let's just go ahead and read the last rest of the chapter. Oh, never mind. We're not going to get that far. Um, let's read at least through verse 10. Let's read 7 through 10. Who would like to read verses 7 through 10 for us, please? Chapter 12, verse 7 through 10. Tim. <clears throat> the Lord will save the tents of Judah first so that so that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem shall not become greater than that of Judah. In that day the Lord will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. The one who is feeble among them in the day shall be like David, and the house of David shall be like God, like the angel of the Lord before them. It shall be in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplication, then they will look on me whom they have pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son, and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. Okay, I want us to include verse 10 because you see uh, there a clear implication or reference to the New Testament, which we'll discuss more when we get there. But now back to verse 7. And this one's tough for me, uh, but I think if you take it with verse 8, it helps. Who does he say the Lord is going to save in verse 7? He's going to save... Frank. The, the tents of Judah first. The tents of Judah first. So the glory of the house of David, the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem shall not become greater than that of Judah. Now, I don't know if you had any trouble with that, but I had some trouble with that one. But maybe if we look at verse 8, that might help. In that day, okay, when now? When? In that day, the Lord will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. The one who is feeble among them in that day, in that day, shall be like David. The house of David shall be like God and the angel of the Lord before them. Let's look at verse 8 first, then maybe that will help with verse 7. Feeble people among the inhabitants of Jerusalem, God's defending the inhabitants of Jerusalem, spiritual Jerusalem, the church, the kingdom. The one who is feeble will be like David. What's David like? What's it mean to be like David? Susie. Powerful. What's David known for in the Old Testament? He's 
Yeah. Be, yeah, winning battles. Starts out with Goliath. And then he, in the Goliath situation, he talks about how that as a shepherd, he had defeated the bear and he defeated the lion. He can defeat Goliath and he does. And then he becomes known as a great warrior defeating the enemies. Now verse, and then of course king with power and so forth. But verse 8, those who are feeble among the inhabitants of Jerusalem will be like David in that day. Okay. The house of David shall be like God and the angel of the Lord before him. Well, how would this house of David be like God? Well, not obviously omniscient and powerful, but in what way might, might they be like God in the context? Terry. The victor. The victor? And victors by what means? By the power of God. So through the power of God, David's going to be a victor, but the other people will be victors too, even though they're feeble. Okay. They win the victors, the victory. Uh, now, if, that, if that's what that means in verse 8, now back to verse 7 then, you have the tents of Judah are like the glory of the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. They shall not be any greater than Judah. Okay? Does that help or not? I'm not, I'm not sure of the verse, but I, hopefully that will help. Sure. When you look at someone who's living in a tent, on the outside of the city, they don't have the same amount of protection as okay. the people behind the walls. Okay. But God's going to protect them all. And so those that are outside of that realm of the city are going to be protected just as much as the ones inside so that the ones inside do not feel any uh, uh, elevation of their their position above those that are on the outside. So it's like the Gentiles and Israel okay. when they come together in Christ. The, the Jews don't have any greater part in Christ than the Gentiles will have. Okay, that's a good good approach. In any case, the point is, it doesn't matter who you are, uh, God's going to take care of you. Obviously, if you're one of his people, no one people, people, group of people are going to have an advantage over any other of God's people. God's going to care for them all. Even if you're feeble, verse 8, uh, you'll be the victor just as sure as if you're as David. So no matter who you are, if you're a child of God and you serve faithfully, you may be uh, a faithful preacher, an elder, or whatever, or you may be not a preacher, not an elder. You may not even have the ability to speak publicly or whatever. You do what you can, you're going to be a victor. You're going to be part of the winning side because of God. Not because of the people, but because of God. Because of who you're following. That's what I think. Just what basically what Terry said is what I think is what verse 7 is saying. Because the connection to verse 8. Other comments? Okay, let me see what... Uh, I'm not yes. sure about what uh, what it means by the inhabitant. Oh, okay. It's coming back to me what Terry said about the inhabitants of Jerusalem not being greater than those that are in tents outside the city. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. Okay, our question, uh, verse 9 then, what's the end, outcome of the battle going to be? Verse 9, the outcome of the battle is? Susie. He'll destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. All the enemies are going to be the losers. When? When's that going to happen? In that day. Okay, so it's all talking about a particular time in the future. Okay, now then, verse 10, let's go ahead and look at it at least before we leave. God said he's going to pour on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. Now, what does it mean when it talks about 
They will look on me whom they pierced. What's that talking about? Debbie. Jesus. That's the death of Jesus. How do you know? He was pierced. He was pierced? And? Terry. John 19 tells us that's what it means in verse 37. John 19, 37. Here's another one we can nail this one down. It's quoted in the New Testament as applied to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. That's whom the one was that the people pierced, but it brought the spirit of grace and the supplication on the people. That is, we have our salvation, our forgiveness of sins through the fact that he died as a sacrifice for our sins. And the people then mourned for him as mourning for their only son, as one grieves for a firstborn. Okay. So why would they grieve for the one whom they pierced? Karen. Well, they do in Acts 2. They, they, um, they're cut to the heart. Okay. Because they learned their error. Nobody defended Jesus at his crucifixion. Nobody was on his side at that time. But after he rose from the dead and they learned the truth about what had happened, then they began, Acts chapter 2, they began to be converted, they grieved, they realized their error, they became his followers. Not all of them, of course, but many did. The enemies were the ones who were defeated, but those who would follow the Messiah, those who would follow the Christ, uh, they would grieve for what had happened, uh, and but the spirit of grace would be upon them. because of the, of the outcome of it was for their own salvation, which is exactly what the New Testament teaches. Okay? All right. Comments, questions through verse 10. Okay? All right, let's take our break there. So we'll look at verse 11 then. In that day, next time, as we'll continue down through the chapter 12 and then into verse 13, uh, chapter 13 rather, and we'll see other of his uh, prophecy about the future. Hopefully some of the things that we've said will be helpful as we proceed. Anything else before we close?